okay uh, so we are live so uh, a very good evening to everyone joining us live from india and a very good morning to our friends from uh, north america today is a very special day uh, in we are celebrating national technology day and which remarks the anniversary of pokhran nuclear test of 1998 and also india's progress in the field of science and technology it is a day to pay tribute to our two legendary leaders which gave a lot of effort to set india's power on the global stage shri atul atul bihari vajpayee ji and dr apj abdul kalam so for such particular day uh, we are delighted today to have with us uh, shri arvind gupta ji who uh, agreed to do of this facebook live session on the topic india's digital response to covid-19 the ground reality i would like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce our speaker for today and other two uh, moderators who are joining me arvind gupta ji is head and co-founder of digital india foundation a policy think tank working in areas of digital inclusion smart cities internet governance data privacy cyber security and electronics manufacturing he is an adjunct professor at iit bhu teaching data and digital economy he has been on the global fintech top 100 list of influencers and also member of world economic forum's global futures council on digital economy and society in his last role he was the ceo of my gov an initiative of prime minister shri narendra modi to empower citizens of india with participative governance and digitally communicative schemes and policy to the indians he led the digital social media and communication campaign from prime, for prime minister narendra modi which resulted in pm modi creating electoral electoral history and achieving the mission of 272 plus in 2014 election he graduated with a degree in electronics and communication engineering from iit bhu followed by a masters in computer science and mba finance from university of illinois urbana champaign Arvind ji, uh, welcome to today's session, and thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to interact with you. Uh, I also have uh, two uh, uh, moderators with me who are uh, my colleagues, my friends. Uh, I have with me uh, Ayush. Uh, Ayush is a PhD candidate at Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at National University Singapore, working at intersection of machine learning and cyber security. he is a member of the research group on internet of things and industrial control systems at nsu singtel cyber security r&d laboratory he holds mtech in electrical engineering from iit kanpur and btech in electronics and communication from delhi college of engineering the second person we have today is also a special person samir is a phd candidate in princeton working in applied cryptography and in fact he is defending his thesis tomorrow so he is in the line to soon be a doctor and i encourage you guys you know if you want to attend his thesis defense he's an expert in privacy technology and is an iit madras alumnus in mathematics and physics so thank you everyone for joining us and with this i would like to uh, uh, give it over to ayush to start our discussion for today uh namaste arvind ji uh thank you for taking out the time um so let's uh, start by diving uh, into the topic of today's discussion right away um how well was uh, india actually prepared for the covid-19 crisis uh from a technology perspective uh whether it is the health sector or the education sector the it industry startup ecosystem etc uh can you please express your uh, views on this so number 1 uh, tushar ayush and samir um I find myself in a very, very illustrious company, so I'm very uh, fortunate to be with all you young fellows who are probably going to define the future of data and digital economy. Um, I kind of studied in the similar universities. That's been about 30, 25, 30, 30 years ago. So, very privileged to be here. I have actually physically never met you and any of you, so it's indeed a pleasure that we are doing this. Uh, connection on a complete social platform, and then we are doing this uh, webinar and. live interaction on a on a facebook uh, platform uh, i used to answer your question it would be it would be wrong for any country to say that they knew this was coming right uh, the innovativeness uh, of any company whether it's technology or with policy it lies with how fast and how agile they were 
decision making and how fast they could make things happen. Right. So uh, uh, it is not that we could imagine the situation will become so worse. All models went wrong. No, no amount of machine learning or artificial intelligence could predict all models went wrong. Right. It was your model versus my model. So, you know, I think it would be wrong to say that. But the real gist of the matter is how fast did we make decisions? which is a, not a technical issue, but it's a data-driven issue, right? And two is how fast uh, did we reuse or repurpose technology that we already had? And uh, in that, in those both those counts, I think we did very well. We, we reacted very fast as a country, as, as a government, um, both federal and state governments. Um, and, you know, while we talk about the central government, which has reacted very well and you know coordinated a lot of international efforts, uh, the first state which got hit was Kerala, and they've come out pretty well also. So I think this has been uh, Team India throughout in terms of responding very well. Two, how the innovativeness always is if you currently have a technology, right? That's what you're told, told in engineering also, right? Which wherever you studied engineering, IIT Madras, Delhi College of Engineering, I don't know where Tushar went for his engineering. But the first thing you are taught is this is the amount of stuff you have. Instead of re remaking it completely, because that's going to take time, can you repurpose it? Can you quickly solve this problem with the constraints? And in that matter is what India did a very good response. And to reuse the current technology, current stacks that we have to really start doing certain very, uh, you know, uh, groundbreaking things, I think. And some of them will become um, talking points in today's discussion. Um, so that's where I leave it at. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it would be wrong to say any country anticipated it and had the right things in place. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll now hand over to Samir, who has a question for you. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, Arvindji, for joining us today. This is, this is indeed a pleasure. Um, so I'd like to ask about our direct money transfer initiative via the Aadhaar card. So, for instance, in comparison to the U.S., where they, they are still sending physical checks, India has done it in a much uh, much more advanced fashion, I would say. So, could you say a bit more about this initiative? Uh, this is this is exactly what Samir I was telling Ayush. Let me just uh, step back, and because you you know we have 30, 40 minutes for this lively conversation, and I don't want to make this a professorial class that I teach one way. I want to be very interactive. So I'll, you know, I think your audience and a lot of you have heard of this word called India stack, which is Aadhaar at the base of it, which is identity. Simply put, what is this Aadhaar? Aadhaar is just a number, by the way, Samir. It's nothing more than a number. You work in privacy, you work in uh, crypto or something, I was told uh, in your introduction. Aadhaar is a 12 digit number that, uh, that is associated with you. And rest, your password is your biometrics. It's who you are. And what are the biometrics? Very interestingly, 10 fingerprints, which is actually touch-based system, but two touchless, which is your iris scans. And that's how you authenticate yourself. And what Aadhaar does uh, in the, as part of the Aadhaar stack, and it's a complete platform, and it, I'll take five minutes to explain that to you, is, is that it basically says Samir Vag is Samir Vag. Arvind Gupta is Arvind Gupta. It doesn't do anything else. So when you give your Aadhaar number, Right and said, I'm Arvind Gupta. The system goes back and says, yes, this person who's giving this Aadhaar number is Arvind Gupta. And that's the end of story. Right? But, and that by itself is it's useful, but not very useful, but it gives an identity to every single Indian. The technology stack we build around it, which we are talking about direct benefits transfer, is how you use it, how you build an app on top of it. So you have internet, you have the SMTP gateway, Right. Um, you have the TCP IP protocol on top of it, the kind of apps you build, the browsers you build becomes your, your, your environment that the users see. One of the things that the users started seeing along with, so let me explain. So one was Aadhaar. Second thing we brought in was EKYC. Mm -hmm. What is, what is EKYC? It's electronic, know your customer requirement, right? Today you can paperlessly presencelessly verify that I'm Arvind Gupta and do fulfill the KYC requirements that a bank requires, a telco requires, a financial institution requires. Um, we have a digi locker, something like a Dropbox, which is integrated to your documents and your Aadhaar number, right? So every citizen of India gets it. So you have Aadhaar, you have your paper stack, which is verified at source. So your driving license is verified at source. I can take out, I can show you my driving license, I don't know, 
how visible it will be to users, but I'll make an attempt to show it to you. Mm -hmm. These are my issued documents, guys. This is really cool. I think we, I'm sure. You can see it, but I'm trying to bring it towards the screen. This is called DigiLocker. Now, I don't need to now physically certify my, my address and everything that is required for KYC. Remember, Aadhaar is just a username and person. Mm -hmm. Second is I need to give my address proofs, the KYC requirements that comes from DigiLock. Mm -hmm. And the third is the India's famous UPI, the Unified Payments Interface. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you heard about it, but that's the that's the key thing. All these three together, when they work together, that's called India Stack, part of India Stack, and the Jam Trinity. This is what we used immediately when you know when the uh, in mid of March, I think when when you, Samir, what you're talking about, to do what are called direct benefits transfers. With DBT, you can do multiple things. You can, now that's where your computer science comes into play. You can actually say, these are the people, for example, I don't know what the algorithm is applied, but let's say, you can say, hey, you know, I want to rule out all the people who pay taxes in India, because that forms the upper middle class and the upper class of India. Anybody below that, which has an income, which is below the tax level means they need support from the government, which is, which is basically 200 million families, households of India, 190, 200 million households of India. Can we give them a direct intervention to what is called a DBT? Now that's the browser. This is a technology that's the browser on top of it. DBT is an application that the government of India built in with seeded are the hard numbers and can now because it's seeded PAN numbers, your, your income tax numbers also, I know these are the people you can apply a not clause and basically say rule out anybody who pays taxes, anybody else who's there in the Aadhaar system, has their bank accounts tied to the Aadhaar number, can we push out money to them and support them? And that was the first intervention done. And how does it happen? Totally in, a, in two days, 200 million transfers done. Money goes through the, the UPI interface into each person's direct bank account, which is also something that was opened with EKYC, which is a, called the Jandhan accounts. Correct. You guys, two of you guys live in the US, right? Tushar and Samir. Yes. India opened 380 million bank accounts, which, which allows zero balance bank accounts mm -hmm. in, in a matter of less than two years. You know, that's more than the population of America. <laughs> to understand the power of creating a public stack. The kind of platforms US has created is Google, Facebook, you know, Apple, Microsoft, or the China has created Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba, uh, ByteDance. Uh, and now India is probably having uh, also a competing platform, Geo. But the first platform in the world, which is not privately owned, is from India. And that's called Aadhaar platform. And it does multitude of things. And it has more than a billion users today. Aadhaar is 1.25 billion users. Wow, really good. Th that's very impressive. And I mean, so Arvindji, when uh, I finished my PhD from Alberta and then did postdoc at Princeton, uh, so I decided I will take a break after my PhD and travel India. So I, uh, 20, uh, 2019, I decided to like do full backpacking trip from north to south, and uh, took like all the buses and traveled. And I was so impressed, like. I was not imagining this. Like, if you go to rural parts of India, people are using these apps over phones to trace when the bus will be coming. And the kind of connectivity, they're using Paytm everywhere, which is very impressive because when I was growing up, I was not seeing. I'm not impressed that they're using Paytm everywhere, but um, you have to understand at the base of Paytm again is UPI. UPI. Yeah, so, so again, it, it ties to the same thing. So, but my point here is that um, this has just kind of bursted out like. Uh, uh, organically, um, in past couple two, two, three years, we have seen a lot of work which has been done in this particular sector. And with that particular thing, I was reading uh, some news yesterday, and uh, Niti Aayog uh, Chairman uh, Amitabh Kant he posted uh, there was a news that this Arogya Setu app, which is currently one of the most downloaded healthcare uh, app and among the top ten downloaded apps in the world. And we have reached almost nine crore peoples in country, uh, which is almost seven percent of our total population. So, how many people actually are today connected digitally in India to us? And from that particular work, how many are actually uh, being uh, connected to our? Sir, sure. at this, this point? is something that I built. Um, you know, we I was part of that. You know, I was fortunate enough to serve the government. 
um, uh, as, as the CEO of MyGov, we have a dashboard which shows everything live, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about up, uh, approximately 9 crores. I'll give you the exact number of users who are using Aragya Setu right now. It's 9.82 crores as of right now. We have transparency in whatever we build in this country. Um, so the point that you make about uh, Aragya Setu, let me just come, come to that. This is where probably Ayush's question comes into play. Can we, uh, you know, we did we react fast enough? We didn't have Aragya Setu on the 1st of March. But did we make it fast enough? Yes, we did. There were bugs like any software has, and we fixed those bugs, and we are fixing those bugs as they come in. Correct. I mean, uh, all of you are somewhere connected to software, hardware, and that that field, and maybe the audience that we are, I'm talking to today is also in that space. I mean, which version of Windows are we using today? Which version of Apple are we using today, right? I mean, browser has gone through hundreds of iterations. So uh -huh. same thing. The point is the culture has changed that if we have a problem, we change it very fast. Arugya Setu is, is, uh, is works on a concept Again, Samir would be interested in this. It's called, you know, pool data. You pool your data for public good, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there is an exchange of goodness for privacy. You're not letting go of your privacy, but for 14 days, your data is in a way available to a, to a system in case you need to be alerted, or if in case, unfortunately, you, I mean, uh, you know, you you are tested positive or um, you come in contact with somebody who's tested positive, you can alert everybody around yourself. Correct. And it's a basic system where no private information is exchanged, but a token is exchanged with anybody you come in close proximity to, a Bluetooth-based token uh, that is exchanged with a phone, phone-to-phone. -phone. It's a machine-to-machine -machine communication over Bluetooth, right? Uh, it's a need of the hour. You have, it's, you have kind of pooling your data to, uh, to come out and say, hey, I, I'm going to do public good. Is it required in normal circumstances? No. The statement of purpose says once this is over, whenever that we describe to be over, this data will be erased. It's stored only for the last 14 days. And that too in your application, in your own control, it's only shared to the server when you become at risk. And that's how it is designed, it's a simple thing. And it keeps giving you alerts and different other things. And um, but the fact it has become, it is something that is very omnibus and very ubiquitous in India, it's very important because it doesn't work in a particular area if only five people out of 100 have it. It works if 50 people in an area, about 54, 55% people in an area need to have it for it to be effective enough, right? Correct. Now, I, Tushar, the point you make, let me come to that. Six years, I've seen a difference where? Six years ago in this country, and that probably is applicable to many other countries too, but we have seen the highest differentiation. We had 14 crore, 140 million internet connections in India in 2014. Today, we are looking at 600 million um, smartphones slash internet connections in India, about 60 crores. Cost of data used to be $4 per GB per month. We are looking at 12, 10 to 12 cents per GB per month. <laughs> you see the difference, 40 times difference. What it has done, our data consumption pre-COVID, COVID times, so it has gone up probably five times. But pre-COVID, our data consumption used to be five, six years ago, 0.2 GB a month and an average. Today, it's about 12 GB a month, 11 to 12 GB a month. So can you see 50 times data growth, 40 times reduction in cost? That is what is the, the internet has become a way of life in India. It's no longer a, a urban phenomena. So what you observed it to be a rural phenomena, it's absolutely true. Marketers are saying that. Um, the latest study is saying that. Everything is saying that. Question is the buying power. And we, you know, that's an economic discussion and we can come to that. But the real thing that we are seeing is that internet today has become very pervasive. It's really fulfilled the dream of internet, it's, it's become the enabler that everybody in India is using it. Our studies say almost 98, 99% of families in India have at least one smartphone in them. India has 250 or millions, 25 crore families, 60 crore phones. So, you know, of course, many families, urban families, everybody has it. Everybody probably has more than the number of people in that family, but the rural side, at least one. Mm -hmm. So, Arvind ji, um, ye Tushar ne jo 
आपका जो प्रश्न उठाया है क्वेश्चन उठाया है तो उसी वेन में आगे हम अगर कंटिन्यू करें तो रिसेंटली एक फ्रेंच सिक्योरिटी रिसर्चर एलियट एंडरसन का आर्टिकल सामने आया था जिसमें उन्होंने आरोग्य आप में कुछ सिक्योरिटी एंड प्राइवेसी कंसर्न्स जो है वो उजागर किए हैं और इसी तरह अगर देखे तो आधार के टाइम में भी जब जिसको यू ने डेवलप किया था उसमें भी ये सेम सिक्योरिटी रिसर्चर ने और कुछ और रिसर्चर्स ने भी सिक्योरिटी कंसर्न्स जो है वो सामने लेके आए थे तो ये जो एन है और ये जो बाकी गवर्नमेंट एजेंसीज हैं जो ये सब डिजिटल इनिशिएटिव और ये एप्स डेवलप कर रही है वो कैसे सिक्योरिटी रिसर्चर्स के साथ बेहतर वे में कोऑपरेट और कोलैबोरेट कर सकती हैं ताकि इस तरह के इश्यूज आगे कम से कम आए आयुष आपने हिंदी भाषा में मेरे से सवाल पूछा मैं हिंदी में इसका जवाब दूंगा मुझे नहीं पता कि आपकी जो ऑडियंस है उसके अंदर सब हिंदी समझते हैं कि नहीं समझते हैं बट मैं मैं ये अपेक्षा करता हूं कि क्योंकि आपने हिंदी में पूछा है सब समझते होंगे देखिए जो आपने पूछा कि फ्रेंच रिसर्चर जो हैं जो जो सिक्योरिटी रिसर्चर या एथिकल हैकर अपने आप को कहते हैं एलियट एंडरसन उन्होंने कुछ बताया है पहले तो वो अनोनमस थे बट कई बार वो टीवी पे आकर अब तो इंटरव्यू भी देने लगे हैं वो वो जो उन्होंने जो बताया है आई मीन इफ इज वेल बीनिंग देन आई थिंक दैट दैट फीडबैक ऑलवेज हैज बीन टेकन हर दम उस फीडबैक को लेकर उसमें जो सुधार की जरूरत होती है और अगर आपने उनका ट्वीट भी देखा हो उसके बाद उन्होंने बोला था कि एनआईसी की टीम उनसे टच में थी और टच में उन्होंने जो वन टू वन जो भी कन्वर्सेशन करी है वो हुई है और उसके बाद उस पर जो भी इम्प्लीमेंटेशन है वो आई एम श्योर हो गई है कोई भी ऐसी ऐप नहीं होती है जो जो पहले दिन से परफेक्ट होती है मैं उसी पॉइंट को रहने वाला हूँ जो उसमें अगर कोई कंसर्न्स हैं या कोई बहुत सारी चीजें हैं जो सुधार इम्प्रूव हो सकती हैं उसको इम्प्रूव किया जाएगा और कर दिया गया है अगर कोई एकदम इमीडिएट ग्लेरिंग प्रॉब्लम थी उसको ठीक कर दिया गया ऑलरेडी जहाँ तक मेरे को जानना है लेकिन आप ये देखिए कि आयुष कोई भी चीज ऐसे नहीं बनती विदाउट टेस्टिंग या चाहे स्पीड उसमें नेसेसरी थी तो विदाउट टेस्टिंग कुछ भी चीज रोल आउट नहीं टेस्टिंग करी गई थी एक प्रोसेस होता है एनआईसी का भी बिफोर एनीथिंग इज होस्टेड ऑन टू द गवर्नमेंट क्लाउड एक उसकी टेस्टिंग प्रोसीजर होता है एक सर्टिफिकेशन चाहिए होती है उसको लोकल यू नो सिक्योरिटी एक्सपर्ट टेस्ट करते हैं सर्टिफाई करते हैं तो ही उसको होस्ट किया जाता है ये प्रोटोकॉल है स्टैंडर्ड प्रोटोकॉल है गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया का उसमें कुछ चीज रह जाती है या कुछ चीज मिस हो जाती है या कुछ नई टेक्नोलॉजी के थ्रू या किसी किसी और पुश के थ्रू यू कैन ब्रूट फोर्स के थ्रू यू कैन गेट इन और कैसे प्राइवेसी का ख्याल रखा गया ये ये एक्चुअल में सामने आ रहा है कि गवर्नमेंट ने इसको लोगों तक पहुंचाने की कोशिश की है आई थिंक इट्स वेरी गुड इनिशियटिव अब मैं आप लोगों ने जब ये डिस्कशन व्हेन यू स्टार्टेड दिस डिस्कशन तुषार इफ यू विदाउट यू आस्किंग वन क्वेश्चन आई वांट टू आस्क यू वन क्वेश्चन टुडे इज द नेशनल टेक्नोलॉजी डे हां जी इट इज सेलिब्रेटेड एज द वन ऑफ द यू नो टुडे इज ऑलमोस्ट हाउ मेनी इयर्स हैज पास्ड देन दैट वी डू द वी डिड द पोकरान ब्लास्ट राइट 22 या 22 इयर्स 1998 सो डू यू नो व्हाट इज नेविक्स gps location uh, building and today both the things are happening we have a satellite and now the chips at least are going to be available on the android phones um, later in um, uh, this year actually actually uh, very shortly on android uh, are the navix gps uh, uh, compatible chips will be available 
I think I've heard that the Navix chips are actually, they actually achieve much more superior accuracy in terms of location tracking. Absolutely. So yeah. th these are the things that you talked about, are you, how we are prepared. It's thinking of that once I have this available. And of course, COVID is now here to stay. You, you can use certain things without dependence on somebody else much faster. Our innovation has to lie in whatever we are building, quickly repurpose and reuse them to things at hand. Okay. And uh, Navix is also to be talked about in the same vein as we talked about Aadhaar, as we talk about UPI, uh, as we talk about MyGov, whatever we else we talk about, we have to talk about Navix also. So if, because you didn't ask, I don't, just, just wanted to mention that you have to understand the importance of Navix as we go along in this uh, gated globalization. So what will Same happen page. is that the, the world is going to have a lot of you know, you said you're doing research in 5G or, you know, working in a company in 5G. 5G is going to bring about new battles. We have not emphasized, I mean, if 5G had happened pre-COVID, it would have been a different 5G. Now, post-COVID, uh, you don't know whether, you know, some of our friendly neighbors are going to, what role they're going to play on that or not. So, so, so just a follow-up question on that 5G aspect. So, I mean, I'm impressed uh, by what Geo has done uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, I have visited them, uh, amazing set of people. The, my, my still one thing which I still don't understand, maybe you can educate us on that. The 5G battle is one on the side of where it's about data and data is going to the people, but the core manufacturing of 5G, for example, the manufacturing of chips or manufacturing of base stations, we are still heavily, the, the biggest consumer of 5G market is still relying either on companies of Sweden or companies of Finland or China to to uh, uh, to basically uh, be up one of the players in 5G, but we don't stand anywhere in terms of manufacturing those chips and manufacturing those base stations or or hard uh, or the recipe or the hardcore technology of semiconductors. So be, because you also mentioned uh, that you have been into electronics manufacturing, um, so what is your take on that? Like we still, I feel like we are way behind in the 5G space in terms of electronics manufacturing. Are a, a well meaning question. Simple answer is the story is not even uh, in India, it's not even started. And uh, let me tell you, India will surprise the world in some of the 5G stuff we will do. It's an opportunity India is going to capture. We may not be able to put up a semiconductor uh, plant, but that, that's where collaboration will come in. Correct. There is a lot of supply chain for, uh, for the 5G ecosystem is at play and play globally which india wants to bring to india and use in india it, it is it, so um the handset uh, uh is it, you know many people confuse 5g as handsets only there is a as you rightly said there is a lot of from the network to the to the bds stations to the handsets it, there's so much of things in between that i think we probably cannot produce the chip in such a short time because we don't have the semiconductor facilities but we can co-create and there is a there is a lot of thinking on that how we can do it at very fast time and I, I, I mean a follow-up question on this is like uh, uh, there has been a huge push at a government level especially uh, i have been visiting uh, indian institute of science and iit bombay uh, as uh, um, for lectures and as a, as a visiting faculty they want to push indigenous development of semiconductor technology especially gallium nitride because it has also strategic importance for country for space and defense <laughs> So, uh, still at end of mighty, like, um, uh, I'm not sure if government, of course, private sector, it's hard to do that kind of investment, but government is planning any sort of thing in terms of semiconductor manufacturing. Excuse me. Uh, sorry, say that again. Government is planning what? Private sector, it's hard to make such big investment to have these fabs, but is government planning to have such kind of fabs, which can be of strategic importance for space and defense? Of course, that's a strategic sector. There has been a lot of uh, talk about some companies that we were in discussion with uh, on the same area, uh, not one, but two. So there has been a lot of um, both, both forward movements and setbacks, but the, the government is a partner. The government doesn't want to run the business. The government wants to invest, give land, but we, we you know, the, its expertise lies with somebody else to run that business. Correct. correct so correct. Uh, the government will be a part of it, not run it. Got it. Got it. Uh, Arvind ji, since we were talking about 5G, so um, uh, one of the important applications of 5G is actually telemedicine. Uh, 
ഇന്ത്യാപ്ഷൻ <laughs> 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 do you think india has uh, the required infrastructure for telemedicine and uh, what what are the ongoing efforts uh, on this front ayush uh, one thing that has come out of this crisis is india's telecom sector mm-hmm. apart from the health sector the, the you know the government uh, the cops the sanitation workers who have really done a great job right health sanitation right. the other sector which has done stupendously well is the telecom sector our our uh, telecom networks which is uh, bandwidth providers have held on we used to just start all of us started working from home imagine the load that has suddenly shifted from offices to homes but we, we pretty much held on why i say that is it's 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 very very important um, to understand that india has a lot of resilience uh, when it comes to uh, the telecom sector telemedicine uh, is already very much there in india you can't see the amount of startups uh, i've seen today in a, in a venture capital meeting we have a lot of startups in telemedicine 5g and telemedicine are related a little bit but not dependent on each other no mm-hmm. not that we are going to wait for 5g to happen for telemedicine to happen yeah if you're doing advanced uh, surgery on a on a on a remote connection then you need you don't you, you right. don't need any latency <laughs> and that's where 5g will be helpful If I'm doing a normal consultation uh, I think I can do on a 3G 4G network it's not a issue right so you have to distinguish between telehealth telemedicine to robotic surgery being done remotely or surgery being done are there for correct where there is a where there is a latency requirement two things number one again when i talk about agile policy making in march till march we didn't have a, a, a clear cut policy on tele uh, medicine it's now a policy allowed we didn't have a clear policy on online pharmacies now allowed in in, in matter of two weeks okay now tele medicine is legal in india people offer it people are offering it there is uh, you know i know uh, uh dr shetty is uh, set up in uh, in karnataka does a uh, lot of telemedicine there is a lot of other uh, centers offering telemedicine i have a startup that i advise is doing telemedicine it's not something that is uh, that is you know new to india of course you will need 5g for as i said when you get into more where latency has to be very very zero right. so so Arvind ji, I would like to shift the conversation a little more to a forward-looking initiative. So this is something you talked about in one of the initiatives about public. So um, I've thought about this for a while, and so when I look at the U.S. Silicon Valley culture, I think it's a very capitalist venture, and the the sole motive there is profit. Like you want to raise more money, and I feel that these systems are somehow devoid of humanity. Like uh, for instance, like look at amazon or uber and what happens to the real workforce like the people who are working towards it so for me at least india is is very different like india does have a lot of this humanity so my question is uh, could you talk about how indian uh, like there are indian initiatives which work towards sort of detaching this technology and from its entry to this capital and bring back the potential for public good so for instance just having systems that uh, are actually good for the public as opposed to raising more money for for the people who start the venture so me that's an excellent question and it's a favorite question one of the favorite thought provoking questions i have mm-hmm. so see you have to understand i lived in silicon valley for many years silicon valley innovates for the top 1 billion mm-hmm. right i mean that's the right. nature of silicon valley the consumption is for the top people in the world mm-hmm. and india's model of digitization and fourth industrial revolution is bottom up you start with unconnected mm-hmm. let me give you an example mm-hmm. can you work on facebook without internet mm-hmm. whereas in india you can transfer money using upi without internet mm-hmm. our, our our design theory is keeping in mind the, the lowest person in the value chain 
and if you any of your friends are there in india mm -hmm. right, ask them this question you know upi works on a on a non uh, internet connected phone we didn't know that i mean this is first time i, I i'm hearing this you can try <laughs> this is called it's called star 99 hack you want to see this you want to show it to your people sure sure yeah show you so suppose this phone didn't have the internet so i dial star 99 hack okay correct you will see something happening welcome to star 99 hack correct this is this is and you'll see my bank account has come you can see icici bank any request here. money check balance my profile pending transactions yeah upi pin correct this is uh, this is not a internet connection this is a, this is this transaction happen over ussd uh -huh. this transaction can be done over 18 different languages so to answer your question samir india is leapfrogging into the fourth industrial revolution not from the top down approach but bottom up approach and know. bottom up approach is a societal approach exactly looking at how anybody who's not connected today we want to connect everybody mm -hmm. still a person who's not connected still a person who's 75 plus can he, can he or she walk into uh, an assisted mode and still do his or her transactions 350 uh, Black people, 3.5 crore people in India, 30, 35 million people in India, who are senior citizens, give their proof of life. Simple thing as that, proof of life using their mobile phone or assisted center. They go and say they are alive. You talked about U.S. I mean, I don't want to berate any country, but any anywhere in the world, you you need to give a proof of life every six to twelve months to get your pension. Correct. In India, you don't need to go to a government office. You can give it from the comfort of your home. You can walk into a citizen service center. You can walk into a post office, and that's it. Just give your thumb impression or iris scan. Say you are alive and you are done. Your pensions will still will come. That is the disintermediation, that potential of technology that India is doing, but it's a bottom up approach. We are not trying to solve the problem for a few. We are trying to solve the problem for the bottom of the pyramid. So once you do that, and that's the difference in approach of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley does not have enough problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> problem money, <laughs> don't have problems. Correct, correct, correct. We, we are a country. We have a lot of problems, mm -hmm. and because of that, we have this common stack, the India stack, which everybody is available. So we can do frugal innovation. Mm -hmm. And and our approach of tech innovation is very different. So you have the base, you have the foundation, but work on core problems. Don't spend too much of money. So a dollar in India goes a long way in terms of innovation versus a dollar in Silicon Valley. Yeah. That's great. I think this is, I'm sure, like very helpful even to our broader audience, and especially coming from you, I think you probably know this entire stack inside out. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think Tushar, do you want to go next? Yeah. So Arvind ji, my uh, my question is again follow up on what we were discussing. So a lot of us like uh, who did PhDs in US. Make it the last question, Tushar. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. So maybe I, I will I will uh, just make it a very generic question, not related to COVID scenario. A lot of Indian students and scholars who have done their studies abroad and who are into professional career, we are always looking for opportunity to come back to India and. because in the end we always had that feeling in the heart that if we are not doing enough for the country it's we are not satisfied and i think you your life story and your journey has been very similar to us so in a broader sense and to our different audience watching us who are in different schools what what is your message to them in the terms of uh, you know what kind of opportunities we should look in and what are the kind of right platforms for engagement because sometimes it becomes hard whom you should approach whom you should write whom you should talk because we have been so disconnected now it becomes harder for us to take that initiative and connect with people so can you sure. i think i think um, um, let me first say i don't think so you're disconnected Mm -hmm. you guys are doing this conversation you are very much connected i lived in an era where there was no facebook there was no youtube there was no live okay uh -huh. so we could still be connected you are very much connected to india you know more about india sometimes than we do because you are reading news and you are doing everything else yeah. the, the real thing is the intent is good you can find a way the startups the ecosystem the university the research all uh, i think is very different from what it was 25 years ago I mean, multitude of startups today are, uh, you know, from people like yourselves who are returning from overseas and saying we need to do work here. It is um, India, you know, has more research labs than uh, as a country. Uh, 
R&D centers in the world as, as any country would have. It's just that we do R&D for a lot of multinationals. But that's a good first place to start with if, if that's, that's something that excites you. So there are a lot of opportunities, uh, teaching opportunities, research opp opportunities, startup opportunities that exist. And uh, if one makes a outreach, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, the only thing I want to say is that uh, in today's uh, world, which is, you know, which is in a way borderless, I think you can work for India sitting from anywhere. Correct. As it is, we are coming from work from home kind of situation. <laughs> and in that, in that uh, whether I'm sitting here or my kids are sitting here and studying the U.S. lecture, it's it's one and the same thing. So I think uh, physical location will really make very little difference in what problems you have to solve. And keep that in mind when you do that. So in fact, it may work out to be for, for better. You know, you may enjoy the uh, whatever if you live there for other reasons and you want to live there in other reasons, but still solve some problems which are very local to India. You can, you know, you can collaborate, work in an environment which allows you to do that. Today, there are many companies in India which are saying, we don't want you to come to office. You just work from where you are. Correct. That where where you are could be your um, you know uh, uh, Tucson in Arizona. I don't know where you are, Phoenix or Tucson, but wherever you are in Arizona or wherever you're sitting in Singapore or wherever in Princeton, beautiful Princeton, that uh, Samir is staying. So who cares? Correct. I mean, this time zone will be different, but that's about it. So I think it's a very very different world that we will be entering soon, and uh, we've already entered that. But uh, on the other side of this, it's a lot more opportunities will come up and you know companies will be more flexible to say hey, i need talent i didn't don't need to see their face um, in my office so correct i think correct. You'll, you'll get a lot more opportunities to work thank you arvindji uh, amazing i've been following you on, on over linkedin for i think past two or three years i read almost all uh, your uh, posts and your articles so it was a pleasure talking to you and i think we got a lot of clarity on different subjects and um, to our audience as well, uh, we will continue such kind of conversation with field experts and technocrats, and uh, we will be having another live session in upcoming weeks. So thank you uh, for joining. Good luck, guys. And good luck, uh, Samir, for your PhD defense tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs>